the last episode ended with a lot of griping about the condition that our valves are in. But before we get back to offending machine shops with my handiwork, we do need to clean up the cylinder heads a bit more. We will get back to scraping and brushing, but first we need to take care of a few broken exhaust bolts. Both the first and the sixth bolts are broken off in the driver's side head. And to make things more annoying, they're both broken below flush. We'll be using the welder to get those out, so we'll try to clean up the bolts and the area around them. Then we'll build up some weld on top of what's left of one of the bolts. We can set a nut on top of that and keep building it up until it's filled. We'll let that start to cool and repeat that same process for the other broken off bolt. We'll wire brush those off and give them a few minutes to cool down and then go at them with a wrench. It took quite a lot of force, but the first bolt did start to turn. And pretty soon we were able to get it all the way out. The other bolt took a lot less force and we were easily able to remove it. I'm sure both of those broke while loosening, but it's interesting that that number six bolt looks like it started moving since there wasn't nearly as much of it still threaded in. It wasn't surprising to see these broken off in the head though, because it's not exactly uncommon for exhaust bolts to break. We'll go back to the wire wheel to make sure those areas are clean and free of slag. Then we'll go over all of the threaded holes in the cylinder head with a thread chaser. Some of the typically unused ones were pretty rusty and really needed this step. We'll make sure all of the exhaust port threads, valve cover threads, intake manifold threads, and all the rest are in good shape. We need to work on all of the gasket surfaces, and to get them nice and clean, we're going to use the same wire wheel that we used on the engine block. Again, this is a soft, stainless wheel, and it will not damage this cast iron. There is an argument to be made for surface finish, as in, you don't want the surface to be too smooth because it makes it easier for the gasket to slide around. This isn't something I've had a problem with after using the wire wheel, but it is worth considering. Now is also a good time to check the cylinder head for flatness. As far as I can tell with just a straight edge, both of these cylinder heads are totally flat. Once we have the head gasket surface looking nice, we'll start working on the exhaust ports. Pretty soon, they were looking just as good as the cylinder head surface, and it was time to switch to the intake side. This had received zero attention up until this point, and it was looking pretty nasty. We'll go around with the razor blade scraper and clean off as much of the old gasket material, rust, and stuck on debris as possible. Some of it was really stuck on, so this took quite a while. But after 25 minutes of that, things are definitely looking better and we'll go back around with the wire wheel. That worked out really well and gave us a nice looking surface. After that, we'll also use that razor blade scraper to clean the machined flat front and rear cylinder head surfaces. Then we'll flip the head over and clean off the valve cover gasket surface. This had a surprising amount of material stuck to it and needed its own round of scraping and wire wheeling. That's the last major surface we need to clean, but we can't forget about the valve guides. For those, we're going to be using this 50 caliber bore brush. We'll spray it down with WD-40 and spin the brush on a power drill all the way through the guide. Working that back and forth seemed to be doing a really good job of cleaning it out, so we'll repeat that same process for all of the guides. I thought it might need more than that, like some scotch Bright or even a stainless wire brush, but the bronze one seemed to be doing a really good job. We'll make a few passes through each of the guides, and then repeat all of these steps on the other cylinder head. This one didn't have any broken off exhaust bolts, but otherwise it cleaned up in the exact same way. And once that one was done, once again we were left with a big mess. But it's better for it to be on the floor than on our cylinder heads. After that we took the passenger side head back over to the workbench, and we'll use this wire cup brush to try to clean out the runners, the valve seats, and the combustion chambers. The heads are looking much better than before, but there are still some crusty areas and I didn't want that to interfere with any of the valve lapping we're about to do. For the rustier intake runners, we'll also try to clean out as much as possible with a regular wire brush. This also would have been a good time to port match the cylinder head to at least the intake manifold gaskets, but I didn't end up taking that step. After that last bit of brushing, we'll spray on more WD-40 and try to clean off any debris that's in the valve area. 
And after going through each of the chambers with that, we'll run a shop towel through each of the valve guides. This should help make sure that there's no debris in there, because we don't need to be grinding anything in that area. Once everything seems clean enough to proceed, we'll put together our valve lapping setup. Using the intake valve, 3 8 inch fuel hose, and a half inch tap. We'll thread that as far into the hose as we can get it, and then chuck the tap into the drill. Hand lapping is great and all, but when you need to remove as much material as we do here, you would probably be there for weeks doing that. We'll also need a fair amount of valve grinding compound, and this Permatex is what we'll be using. Before installing each valve, we'll make sure the stem is clean and pour some 5WD-30 over it. The engine oil will help it spin easily and non-destructively in the guide. Then we'll apply some valve grinding compound to its face, and with the valve pushed all the way up against its seat, we'll slip the rubber hose over the valve stem and start spinning it with the drill. What seems to work the best is a constant spinning of the valve, with some inward and outward motion so that the valve grinding compound can keep moving around and grinding itself down evenly. After just a little bit of this, the abrasives in that compound have worn down and we need to apply some more. And that's basically the whole process. Every once in a while we'll pop the valve out, wipe off all of the grinding compound, and see where we are. It looks like we're heading in the right direction, but it's going to need a bit more time. Along the way, I ended up adding a clamp to the end of the rubber hose to help keep it from spinning on the valve tip, which helped a lot. And by the time we take another look, it seems like we have the valve face and seat right where we want them. And we'll keep it on moving. We'll switch to the exhaust valve for that same cylinder and repeat the process. It took over 10 minutes of grinding to get that first intake valve looking good, but on the left here is that exhaust valve after only about two. The comparison between the valve we were just working on and one we haven't gotten to yet is pretty stark. This smooth, dull gray surface is what we're looking for on every single valve face and seat. It's not going to be totally perfect, N nothing in this engine is really, but it is a huge improvement. Now, when the valve is closed, it should be sealing all the way around its perimeter. The angle and position of each valve's face should match exactly to its seat in the cylinder head. At this point, it is especially crucial that we don't mix these up. As you can see, that abrasive valve grinding compound really does get everywhere, which is why we want to do this before a final cleaning of the cylinder heads. It took quite a while to get through all of the valves on one cylinder head, but we had to pay attention and make sure each one was just right. Here's a close-up of an intake valve going through that same process. These have a more narrow seat, but since the valve itself is larger, the surface area is pretty comparable. Also, in this case, the intake valves were the particularly rusty ones, so they needed a lot of time. Part of this is due to the location of water ingress, and part of it is because I believe the exhaust valves are stainless while the intakes are not. In most cases, like this one, the valve seat was looking good before the valve face was. These seats are hardened, I believe it's some sort of induction hardening process they put them through, and hopefully that hardening is deep enough that we're not grinding it all off. Hopefully. While well, going through this process for both cylinder heads, I wanted to make sure to get some nice before and after shots of the same valve. Of course, it only makes sense to use my favorite subject, the intake valve from cylinder number 3. Here it is before any valve lapping at all. The surface is very badly pitted all the way around its perimeter. There isn't a single smooth area on the valve face. The seat doesn't look nearly as bad, but it's certainly not looking good either. You can just barely make out the machining lines in it, and there aren't any huge chunks missing or anything, but still, it has certainly seen better days. After spending 25 minutes grinding this valve, this is what it looked like. This tiny cratered section we're looking at here is pretty much the only blemish left on the valve face. You can make out very clear step lines in the valve face, almost like you'd see from the tooling on a lathe. The same thing is visible on the valve seat, which is uniformly gray and looking just about perfect. 
but to try to reduce that last little bit of pitting on the valve face, I wanted to take it a little bit farther. So I spent another 10 or so minutes on it, and this is the final product. What I've done here, along with smoothing out the face, is created some questionable valve geometry. Instead of a smooth transition to encourage flow, now there's a pretty hard step at the upper edge of the angled part of the valve face. We've also narrowed the margin of the valve, though I don't think significantly enough to cause problems in our application. Comparing the before picture to the after picture, you can see exactly what happened to the angles here and how much material was removed. It's what we're going to have to live with. We can see the same thing looking at a picture of the seat before grinding and after. The seat is noticeably significantly wider than it was before. It's such a large amount that this valve tip should have a measurably different height from the rest of them. We'll keep on moving forward, and once we're done lapping all of the valves in both cylinder heads, it's time to wash them off. We'll take both cylinder heads outside and plonk them down on a few blocks of wood to keep them lifted off of the ground. Then we'll give them a solid coating of engine degreaser. This is just generic Supertech branded degreaser, and we gave the heads three coats of it. We'll let these sit out in the sun for about 15 minutes after that first coat, then fire up the pressure washer. Just like we did for the engine block, we're using this turbo nozzle to get some really solid cleaning action. There are a lot of corners and curves in these castings, and we want to make sure we hit them all. We'll make sure to focus on the outside faces of the cylinder heads, as well as the insides that are still filled with rust and grinding compound. After a few minutes of that, we'll flip the cylinder heads over and repeat the same process for the other side. They'll get sprayed down with degreaser, sit for a minute or two, and then get the pressure washer treatment. We'll try to get all of the ports, thoroughly clean the combustion chambers and valve areas, and wait until we're just seeing clean water coming out of and off of the cylinder heads. Again, there are a lot of corners, curves, and little details for dirt to get stuck in. We'll make sure to take our time and go over every inch of the surface area we can. And once it seems like we've got it all, we'll trade in the pressure washer for a brush and dish soap. This final cleaning pass should help get rid of any oils or abrasives that were left behind. In this case, it didn't seem like there was a lot of grime left on the exterior, but sometimes the pressure washer won't get everything. In between the latherings, we'll keep rinsing everything off with the garden hose. We'll spend some time with the plastic bristle brush that we are oh so acquainted with and go over every side of the heads. We'll also use a smaller brush to clean all around the valve seats and the edges of the combustion chambers. And a plastic bristle bore brush on all of the valve guides. Then we'll give it one final, very thorough rinsing and carry it inside to dry it off. The blowgun attached to the air compressor will get it done, but we'll have to be careful to get every bolt hole and every little nook and cranny. Once it seems like everything is dry, we'll spray the head down with WD-40. After it has been thoroughly coated, we'll go back over all of the machine surfaces with a shop towel, trying to make sure there is no surface rust forming or other debris left on them. It's also a good time to do at least a visual examination for cracks anywhere in the casting. Then we'll get back to the other cylinder head and make sure it receives the same treatment. A thorough scrub down, then rinse, blow dry, and a protective coat of my favorite water displacing agent. The machine services get a quick wipe down, and then we're ready to get these back on the bench for reassembly. Which means we'll also have to dig back out all of the valve train components. We'll extract our valve rotators from their soak, making sure each one spins freely, and lay them out alongside our cleaned retainers, keepers, and springs. I'm not sure we've pointed it out up until this point, but yes, we are reusing those valve springs. These particular big block springs are not exactly known for being strong, but if I decide I want to, or it seems like it needs it, we can always change those out later. Something we need right now, though, is in this box containing our engine rebuild kit. Most of our gaskets are coming from a C7.4-A kit made by Engine Tech. 
This was specced for a 1993 2500 Suburban with the 7.4 liter and it appears to be correct for our application. We are breaking into that now because we need a new set of valve seals. They are basic umbrella type seals just like the ones we removed. They kind of have a tough job ahead of them as far as keeping oil out of these cylinders, but should at least be able to seal the valve stems well enough. They are all due for a final cleaning before installation, but it's just going to be a simple one. We'll spray down each valve with brake clean and give it a thorough wipe down before putting some engine oil on the valve stem and slotting it back into the cylinder head. And after all that care we took to keep them in order, we better make sure we get them back in the right locations. Then we can drop and place our first rotator and hold up the valve to install an umbrella seal. These seem like a good fit on the valve stems and should do the trick. Then we'll drop on a valve spring with the splash guard facing the cylinder head just like it was when we took it apart and a retainer tops it all off. Out comes the spring compressor with the same setup we used for disassembly, which will get into position over the retainer and tighten down until we can fully see the keeper groove. This spring was compressed a little more than it had to be, but it does make it easier to see what we're doing. With those dropped in and held in place, we can start loosening the compressor. And once it's locking the keepers in, we can fully remove it. And just like that, one valve is fully installed. We'll go through the same thing and pop back in its companion exhaust valve with its own rotator, seal, spring, and retainer, compress the spring enough to reinstall the keepers, and remove the spring compressor to finish its installation. All that's left is to do that for the other six valves in the cylinder head. Luckily, that went smoothly and without issue, and as one final step, we'll take our assembled cylinder head and play it like a xylophone once more. We're just going through this to make sure all of the keepers are fully set in the retainers and nothing's going to pop out of place. Nothing sprang out and hit me in the eye, so I think we're in good shape. Much like so many of our other engine parts, we'll surround that in plastic wrap for storage and set it aside. Then we can finish reassembly of our second cylinder head. Again, luckily, but surprisingly, this went without issue. And with it assembled, that will get wrapped up too. It's been a bit of a process, but that's what it takes to go through and try to make the best out of a pair of rusty iron cylinder heads. These will be set aside, looking like some leftovers in the back of the fridge, and wait until we're ready to reassemble the long block. And we're almost there, I swear. There's just one more episode to get through before we start putting that back together. <laughs>